What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things thereof? Ye are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, and I'll turn it over to, um, to Godfrey. Leander. Leander? Yes, Leander. Okay. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, Kaupapa Church. Uh, that sounded a little bit too long. Happy Sabbath. Yeah, much better. Okay. Um, I must make this confession that uh, I'm not feeling too well. <laughs> and I know it's, it's the worst thing for the speaker, for a preacher to do, to make those apologies at the beginning. Um, but that's the truth. Uh, I'm not feeling well. I have running nose and uh, flu and that has affected my voice. So if I say something that you are not to, you're not going to get clear, uh, stop me and ask me so that I can, make, uh, I can make it clear. Our subject today is, uh, is called free but not independent. Free but not independent. It sounds a little bit confusing, right? How can you be free and yet you are not independent? I thought people who are free, they're supposed to be independent. And this is the idea that we are going to get from scriptures that are prayer. Gracious and loving Father above in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness and for your mercies. Thank you so much for this place of worship that we can come and meet and, and, and sing hymns and study the word together. So, Lord, we just ask for the special presence of the Holy Spirit to be in our hearts and to be in this church building, that he may guide us into all truths to convict us of sin and righteousness. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Free, but not independent. Romans chapter 6 begins with a rhetorical question. Verse 1, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In verse 2, Paul says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, live any longer therein. That's a logical argument, right? If you are dead to sin, then how is it that you can be expected to live in sin? You are dead to sin. Now, this is a continuation of the discussion started in the previous chapter. If you go back to chapter 5, reading on verses 
20, the Bible says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might do what? May abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So Paul is, is saying, where sin abounded, or where lawlessness abounded, much more grace did what? Abound. So someone might think, well, since the state of lawlessness and the state of sin necessitated for the abundance of grace, then we should continue to live in what? In lawlessness so that grace may do what? May abound. It sounds as if the more lawlessness, the condition of a man gets to, the more, the more grace is. So Paul is imagining, after saying this st statement, is imagining someone asking, should, are, you, are you saying because grace does abound, then I should continue in sin? And so this is how he begins chapter 6. He begins with an objection to those who are thinking that grace, the abundance of grace, necessitates lawlessness. So he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God do what? Forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live and longer? In other words, this is as simple as a mathematical problem. One plus one is equal to what? One to two. And no amount of ignorance will do what? Will change the results. Whether you know it or not, the fact is, when the two numbers are added, one plus one, the answer is equal to what? To two. And this is what Paul is trying to say here. That the coming of grace does not, does not give us permit or passport to lawlessness. But what does grace do? Now, if you go down to, to verse 6. To the six, Paul, he tells us or informs us, he educates us what it means to be dead to sin. In verse 6, he says, knowing this, that our old man is what? Is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not save what? save sin. So Paul now tells us what it means to be dead to what? To sin. And as he's telling us, as he's exploring this idea of being dead to sin, he brings in a new concept. And this new concept that Paul brings in is the concept of co-dying and co-resurrecting with who? With Jesus. This is the power of grace. That it makes us to co-die with him and to co-resurrect with him. It makes us new people. It makes us new creatures in who? In Jesus. And so after Paul talks about the state or the character of a person who have experienced the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 14 going down, beginning on verse 15, he now talks about even when we have been liberated, even when we have been set, even when we have been set free, we still have the ability, we still have the freedom to choose whether we are going to save sin 
or to save righteousness. The fact that we have been co-reberated, co-resurrected with Jesus, it does not remove the fact that you can choose otherwise. You still have that ability, you still have that freedom to choose not to choose Jesus as your master. And so in verse 15 he says, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? He says, God do what? Forbid. Now, notice that in verse 1 is the issue of is the issue of sinning in order to get what? To get grace. But in verse 15 is the issue of what? Of having grace in order to do what? To sin. In both, grace seemed to be a passport to do what? To sin. But that's not what grace does. Grace is not a license to live a lawless life. Grace is a power to live a life of obedience to God. And Paul will make this clear when we go to Romans when we go to Romans chapter 3 verses 24. If you would turn to Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Paul there says, being justified freely by his what? By his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So what we see in this is that grace uh, is what inclines God to give his gifts that are free and undeserved by what? By sinners. So grace inclines God to offer himself, to offer the merits that we are, we don't deserve as sinners. And when we go to Romans chapter 5, verse 15, if you turn to Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 5, verse 15, the Bible reads, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, of one, men be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto men. Again, here we see that grace is that quality in God that produces free gift for guilt sinners so that they may be saved. One more text. Romans 11, verses 5 and reading on verses, verses 5 and 6, chapter 11. Verse 5, the Bible says, Even so, then as at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of what? Of grace. And in verse 6, the Bible says, And if by grace, then it is no more of what? Of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But, it, but if it be of works, then, it, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. And again here, what we are getting is that we can't work to earn grace. There's absolutely nothing that men can do to earn grace. Grace is unmerited, undeserved favor that God gives to undeserving sinners. Now, we see that the concept of grace that Paul begins with here is of, of, of the quality of God that makes him to make the provisions of man's salvation necessary and accessible to him. But I want us also to look at grace as the power for living a righteous life. 
If we go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, reading on verses 8. Chapter 9, verses 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8. The Bible, the Bible reads, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now, here Paul is putting grace as the power that helps us to do good works, as a power that helps us to live righteous lives. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. In verse 9, the Bible says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Again, now here we see that Paul is talking about his own infirmities, right? His weaknesses, the weaknesses that we all have. But he also speaks of grace as the power that, um, that, that makes us to live sufficient life according to the demands of God. Grace is not the passport to sin. But grace is the power, one, that enables God to make provisions of our salvation available to us. And not only making those uh, provi uh, provisions of our salvation, but also making, putting that power in us that we may access the provisions that God has made available for us. And this is what Paul means when he says, you are not under the law. In other words, the law does not lead you to salvation. It is grace that leads you to salvation. The law does not confer, does not put on you righteousness that the law demands. It is grace that does that. It is the grace of God that brings the a gift of God in our lives. And when we accept that gift by faith, then we can live in face of the law, in front of the law, uncondemned and undoubted. So we go back to our, our text, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Verse 16. Now Paul, after saying, we are not under the law, but under grace. Now this is not a gospel that would be easily accepted by Jews who believed that salvation is in obedience to the law of God. And that is true. Salvation, the condition of eternal life, is perfect submission and perfect obedience. But here's the problem. You and me are not able to keep the law of God perfectly and diligently. So what happens then when we align ourselves to keeping the law in order to gain salvation? We fall short of the glory of God. We cannot attain to that glory. Inasmuch as the law uh, it points us to Jesus, it does not have the power to take us to Jesus. Inasmuch as the law points in us the need for the Savior, the law does not bring the Savior to us. It is grace that brings salvation to us. Now in verse 16, chapter 6 of the book of Romans, Paul says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves 
servants to obey. His servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, obedience unto righteousness. Now, I want us to explore these uh, three words. Number one, the word yielding. In other Bible versions, um, the word present is used or present. I want also to um, us to look at other words, which, uh, which is a servant. And the last one that I want us to consider is obedience. Now, Paul begins this uh, verse by saying, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves. What does the word yield mean? What is the other word for yielding? Is surrendering. Now, Paul is saying, to whom ye yield, who is surrendering? You, me. So in other words, this is an action which is to be performed by a subject. And who is this subject? This subject is me and you. This is not something that someone else should do for you. In other words, you are free to yield. And no one else can make that yielding, that surrender on your behalf. You have to act it. You have to do it. And he goes on further to say, his servants to obey. What does the word servant mean? It means it's a messenger. Okay. Anyone else? What does the word servant mean? A helper. A worker. A slave. So it can mean all these things. But the perfect translation of this word would be a slave. Now, slave is not, is, is not, is not a beautiful word. It's an ugly word. And especially when we think of it in the context of what was happening here in the 1800s, where people were forced into slavery without regard of their choice. But Paul here seemed to introduce us to another form of slavery, which is absolutely different from the slavery that happened in the 1800s here. He's, he's introducing us to a kind of slavery of which inherent in this kind of slavery is the freedom to choose. And no one wants to hear that we are slaves. But if there's one universal reality that we find in this verse is that we are all slaves. And in this slavery, there are only two masters. And there are only two spirits. And to these masters, you and me have the freedom to choose. The other word that I want us to look is obedience. What does it mean to obey? What does it mean to obey? To follow instruction. Uh, sorry, say that again. What to to do what you are required to do? Trust. Thank you so much for all that. How about if we looked at obedience as submission? Can a man be obedient and not submissive? 
Can a person be obedient and not submissive? Not truly? Let's go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Uh, beginning reading on verse 16. In Matthew chapter 19, we find, what story do we find there? What story do we find in Matthew 19, 16? A rich young ruler, right? What question does a rich young ruler come with to Jesus? It's a question of gaining eternal life. How do I gain eternal life? Now, notice what Jesus' answer is. He says, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the what? Amen. The commandments. In other words, what Jesus is saying, what he is telling this rich young ruler, is that obedience is necessary to obtain eternal life. Right? And what is the response that he gives? In verse 18 he says, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. And in verse 20, the rich young man says, uh, All these have I kept from my youth, what lack like I yet? So here's a, a young man who comes to Jesus. Is this young man obedient to the Ten Commandments? He has kept the Ten Commandments. He has never involved himself in adultery. He has never involved himself in any form of stealing as far as his mind can save him. But what does Jesus do? Uh, going forward in verse 29, 21, he says, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, Jesus invites him to go and sell all what he had, and then come follow Jesus. So now, before this, he says, I'm perfect, I keep the commandment. According to him, right? But here is a point of submission. The point of submission is go sell everything that you have and come follow me. What does that suggest? Slavery. Servanthood. You do, you go and sell all what you have, come follow me. And this is where this man fails. So is it possible that we can be obedient or we can look to be obedient when we are not obedient? Yes. The rich young ruler had this in mind, had this form of obedience which was not obedient at all. You know, God does not care about how many church attendance you make in a year. God does not care about how many Sabbaths you've kept holy in a year. God does not care much about all these other things that are external. God is looking for the ownership and control of our hearts. That is where the true issue lies. We can be moralists. We can keep the law. We can appear as if we are true Christians when deep down in our hearts, our hearts are serving another master. So obedience is about submission. And this is, what, this is the concept that Paul brings to us in Romans chapter 6, verse 
6. I mean verse 16. It's about submission. Yielding your heart to God. A slave is someone, they have, bequent, they have relinquished their rights to live as individuals. They are going to live not according to what they feel or what they want their lives to be. They will live according to how their master wants them to do what? To live. That's a slave. So, we are free, yes, to choose who our master is going to be. But our freedom has a limit. And the limit of our freedom, it cannot go further than choosing who our master is. Because when you relinquish your rights to uh, dictate your own life, you've given that right, that right to the other power, to the other master, what happens? You become under that authority. What they say, you do. And if you don't do, you are not under their authority. And this is why the title of the sermon says, free but not independent. You can choose your master, but you cannot choose how that master will rule your life. You are not independent there. Freedom ends in choosing who your master is. And as we saw in the story of the rich young ruler, God does not coerce us. God does not force us. If there's one greatest gift that God has given to humanity is the ability to choose. And this is why throughout the successive generation, even when we look back in the stories that happened in Babylon, there has been attempts to take away the ability of man to choose for himself. You know, sometimes we say, this is my life, this is how I want it to be. There is truth to that to, to some extent. But this is not how you want your life to be in a, a say. It's how the master wants your life to be, the master you have chosen. Yes, it is true that when we choose a master, we are choosing the kind of life that we need to have. But our freedom of choice has a limit. I want us to consider these um, quotes from Steps to Christ. It says, men are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you, but you need not to despair. Praise God. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. She continues. This is the governing power in the nature of who? Of man. The power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to do what? To exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot, of yourself, give to God its affections. But you can choose to do what? To save him. 
You can give him your will. He will then work in you to do and to, to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So now, who is working the good works in us? It's God. There's no element, not even a 0.00.1% of my works, of my good working out my salvation. No, nothing. Our work, our job is just to make that surrender to who? To God. And when we make the surrender to God, he will work in us both to do, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Our struggle is on surrendering. And that is a struggle that the rich young ruler had. Our struggle is leaving the other master. Now, in Old Testament time, we don't have time to go there, but you can check it. It's uh, in Exodus, I think, chapter 1 or chapter 22. There was this slavery system in the Hebrew economy where uh, a slave, after seven years, they would be required to choose either to continue serving their master or not. They were brought to the gate. If they chose to continue with their master, if after looking at their life and say, before I chose this master, my life was in a mess. I couldn't manage two meals in a day. I couldn't manage to provide for myself. But when I came under the, the authority of this master, at least I have food. At least I have garments to put on. At least my family is living together they would yield to that master for the rest of their lives. And there was something that was needed to be done. And that slave who chose to yield his life to be, as to be in perpetual servitude to this master was brought to the get seat. And there they would pierce his Yes. Blood came out. It was a painful process. And may I pause here for a moment and say, surrendering is not an easy thing. It's not it's something that we can be excited about naturally. Because we love the things of this world. But when we are asked to surrender the things that we love most, it's a painful process. Just as it was a painful process to pierce the ear of that servant who wanted to in perpetual servitude, so it is also a, a painful process for us to surrender to God, to be in perpetual servitude to Christ. But was it worth it? Yes. It was worth it. And after that, they would save their master forever. Whatever happened to them, they would do that willingly because they chose to save him in love. As we come to the conclusion... Let us notice also that there is a wage to this, to this servitude that you choose yourself to be in. In verse, verse 16, some verse it says, the latter part of it, whether of sin unto what? Unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And in the same chapter, in verse 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what does the word Lord mean? It simply means master. 
So we need to ask ourselves a question. What is the end of the decision that I've made? The master that I've chosen to rule my life. What does he give me at the end of it all? If we are going to choose to be slaves to sin, there's eternal death. But if we are going to choose to be slaves to righteousness and making Jesus our Lord, there's what? Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should do what? Should perish? No. Should have eternal life. Dear friends, there are only two things that this servitude is leading us to. Whoever, whichever master that we choose to align ourselves with, there are only two ends, either eternal life or eternal death. But the provisions for our salvation have, made, have been made available through the power of grace. And how much a sinner needs that element of God that inclines us to accept the gift that he has made as available. Grace is not a passport to lawlessness, as many other people have come to understand it. And this is why, in the statement that I want to read, Ellen White emphasizes that we should be preaching grace from the pulpits. Because there in grace lies the power to overcome sin. It lies the power to receive the gift that God has given us. It lies the power of restoration. I just want to read these uh, quotes. The first one is from Steps to Christ, page 44. It says, There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character and secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the law of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. In counsels to parents and teachers, she says, divine grace is the great element of saving power. Without it, all human efforts is valid. It's unveiling. We need grace. The gift of salvation that was made available through God's love, we can only receive it by grace. And finally, she says, what a loss it is to the soul who understands the strong claims of the law and who yet fails to understand the grace of Christ which doth much more abound. You look at the law, at the claims of, of the law, you try to keep it, you don't measure up. Let's look to grace. Let's ask God for more grace in our lives that we may live the perfect lives. Are we free? Yes, we are free. Are we independent? No. Why are we not independent? Because there are only these two masters. When we have chosen them, they rule us. They control us. And we are not independent of their authority as long as we have yielded a power. The only responsibility, the only part is yielding. And we have grace given in abundance that may help us to choose the right master. May it be your will and your desire to choose the mastery of Jesus, who is the king of righteousness.
then all our works of obedience will spring from the fact that Jesus is living in our hearts. It is not us try, not trying to earn salvation, but it is him working in us both to will and to do. May God bless us.